Industry Association, or also known as the NCIA. I am your host, Khadija Adams, founder of Girl Get That Money, a business empowerment coaching and consultancy firm located in Chandler, Arizona, as well as the founder of the Green Street Academy, where we teach you the basics of investing in cannabis stocks. The goal of the Cannabis Minority Report is to share weekly news updates about minorities in cannabis, CBD, and hemp industries. We interview minority entrepreneurs as well as minority-owned companies, companies that support social equity, social equity applicants, and a host of other cannabis leaders and pioneers. Joining me today is my very special guest, Elena the Muse Dorsey. When we return from our commercial break, we will catch you up on the latest news on minorities in the cannabis space and we'll learn more about Elena's journey into the cannabis industry. So if you're watching us on Facebook, now would be a great time to share, click, share, even put it on your timeline and tag a few friends. We'll be back right after these messages. We need to make sure that we get minorities and African Americans, people that have been affected by the war on drugs, indigenous people, brown and black people holistically needs to be a part of this conversation. With the help of NCIA and being an Evergreen member, we believe that we could push this agenda forward. Cannabis business owners, entrepreneurs that really see the bigger picture to say, let's push this agenda forward. We can't do this without you. We need to make sure that our voices are heard. Hey guys, we are back and I want to share some really exciting news with you about the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee of the National Cannabis Industry Association. We have actually appointed new committee leaders um, this was done last week, and I have to tell you, or the week before, okay, and the DEIC has appointed new leaders um, to take our committee to the next level, starting with Christine De La Rosa um, as our committee chair. She's out of Texas. Chris Jensen as our vice chair. He's out of Colorado. And then Helen Gomez Andrews um, as the organizer, and of course, me, Khadija Adams, as the chair emeritus. You know, last year, our committee was able to accomplish some pretty hefty goals and we gained a lot of momentum and a new perspective on our direction as a committee and we were definitely able to move the needle forward. However, with our new leadership team, our future here at the DEIC is looking pretty damn bright if I must say so myself. Having Christine De La Rosa and Chris Jensen and Helen Gomez Andrews at the helm, let me tell you something. Success of our committee is unlimitless. You hear me? That means that we are going to push forward and we're going to move some things. You guys are going to see a totally different DEIC this year and we can't wait. So hats off to everyone from last year and welcome in to our new leaders for this year. Now, another thing I wanted to mention today was the success of the Midwest Cannabis Business Conference. Um, listen, let me tell you something. When it comes down to diversity, we have to shout out the NCIA for hosting an amazing event in Detroit, Michigan in September of this year. And as it is, you know, most people may think or not think, I don't know, but I have to tell you, it is the most diverse crowd I have ever seen at any one conference in the cannabis industry. I had never seen so many black and brown people at one event since I've been in the legal market. And so hats off to the NCIA. You know, we are making major moves in this cannabis industry and we hope that y'all are taking notes, okay? Because understanding that we are not the same organization as years prior. So if you're still mad at the NCIA, you're mad at the wrong organization because we are a totally different organization now. We have completely reinvented ourselves and we've established a new committee that has its hands in every aspect of ensuring diversity for all in the cannabis industry. Way to go, NCIA and the DEIC. 
And next, you guys, I know Mike um, actually took my place. Mike Lomoto took my place. He was my co-host last, um, last week. He did a phenomenal job. I was in Jamaica, you guys, in Kingston. Also went over to Montego Bay and went over to Negril. Um, met with Dr. Lakeisha Jenkins, you guys. And if y'all don't know who Dr. Lakeisha Jenkins is, you better look her up. She is heavily involved in the cannabis industry, not only in California, but also in Jamaica. And she showed me and my business partner around, um, showed us the ropes and how it works. And she took us deep into Jamaica, you know, into the bush. And we met some phenomenal people and leaders in the cannabis space. So can't wait to share more about Jamaica with you guys, but just know, you know, if you haven't followed Dr. Lakeisha Jenkins, follow her. You know, she and I, in 2014, 2015, we were a part of the, the, the actual um, DEIC. It wasn't called DEIC back then, but it was for minorities that the, the NCIA had put together. So it was the beginning of something great. And then it turned into um, the DEIC, which was greater, right? Um, but she is a pioneer and she really paved the way for the DEIC to even be here. So hats off to you. Dr. Lakeisha. Now, according to the roots, Blacks are still getting arrested at higher rates for marijuana possession. Guess what? Even in states where it's legal. First off, y'all wrong for that, okay? <laughs> totally wrong for that. Why are you still harassing us, okay? It doesn't even matter, you guys, if we're, you know, if the state is legal or not, we're still being harassed. Black people are still getting arrested for marijuana possession unjustifiably, you know, and it's crazy. You know, the Journal of American Medical Association released a study that found that while 53% of whites and 46% of Blacks report cannabis use, Black people in the United States were nearly 4% arrested, 4% more likely to be um, cuffed for possession. Guys, these studies don't lie, okay? And, and it's a sad situation, but you know, researchers are still looking to understand how the legalization of marijuana has affected the use of cannabis across many different races. Basically, they found that Black folks will still get arrested for cannabis use at higher rates than whites, even though whites are more likely to use cannabis more so than Blacks. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm living in 2021. We're about to head into 2022. And all I can say to law enforcement and to the federal government is that y'all need to really get it together, okay? And you need to back up. I was about to say something else. I'm sure y'all can fill in the blanks in between there. But anyways, when we return, you guys, we are going to be speaking to Elena the Muse, Dorsey. And we're going to be watching. I'm sorry, if you are watching on Facebook, now would be a great time to hit that share button so that when you come back, we can learn more about Elena and her journey in the cannabis space and just find out more. So if you're on Facebook, click the share button. I think it's down here, over here, or up there, wherever it is. Share it with your friends so that they can watch along with you. We'll be right back. I am the cannabis industry. 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 We are the cannabis industry. And we are proving that regulation works. All right, you guys, we are back with the lead of the news, Dorsey. She is the owner and illustrator with creative strategist tendencies of Philadelphia, and if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, she will correct me, okay? It is a strategic illustration studio. Philadelphia forges immersive visuals for the cannabis industry with brand-driven illustrations for packaging, merchandise, apparel, and murals, a sweet summer child of cannabis. Elena is a Maryland medical cannabis patient with who initiated herself renaissance in 2018 with the plant the muse is committed to solving big business problems and influencing culture by shutting adults up or setting adults up with visual um verse versatile 
wonder, God, I can't speak today. Her start with this, with her product brand, the Endocan band, a cannabis education merch that transforms cannabis plant molecules and autonomy into human-like music entertainers. Here to take us on her cannabis journey is Elena the Muse Dorsey. Elena, welcome to the Cannabis Minority Report podcast. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, jazz hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I pronounced all of that correctly. If I didn't, can you please, for the sake of the audience, go ahead and pronounce the name of your company? Yes, yeah, it's just Faded Lane. So it's Faded Lane. Got it. Faded, but, you know, to get the domain, I threw part of my name in there. So. Got it. Okay. Well, tell us more about you and your journey into the cannabis industry. Yeah. So is that like professionally and with the plant or how we, how we, absolutely. Tell us about your journey. How did you come into the cannabis industry? What made you come into the cannabis industry? So I guess I was guided here. I didn't start consuming cannabis until I was about 28 and I was just smoking with my boyfriend had because I didn't know anything about <laughs> buying anything um but I did find because I had issues with depression and anxiety potentially complex PTSD issues from childhood but um mainly I was losing my mind in 2018 and then I had a light bulb moment of oh remember that time you were smoking and you felt good I was like yeah yeah let's let's look into that and at the same time I was also trying to get started in freelancing and I didn't know how to I didn't know what niche to go in so one of my mentors she was pretty much like oh why don't you get into cannabis I'm like oh that's so smart so that's how I ended up here. It's kind of been to help, you know, my overall well-being and also it's helped me make money. So it's a win-win on my end. Hey, that's a win-win all day long. So tell me, so as an artist, right, did you have any concerns entering into the cannabis industry? And if you did, um, what were some of those concerns and why? So when I first entered the industry, it was mainly from a marketing standpoint. Um, I was doing blog writing for about two years. I still kind of do client blog writing this year. So I'm about three years in. So I've always been or mostly have been an artist, but never really pursued it professionally. So I decided to give it a chance in the industry because I like moving when I don't have competition and I don't think I have competition. Um, my only concern, really it's, I think it's just an artist, especially a commercial artist concern for any industry is not undercharging and not having my work taken without being compensated adequately or at least credited. But yeah, to me, that's about it. It's just not getting ripped off. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Wow. And that's a lot. There's a lot of that going on in the cannabis industry. So now as an artist, you know, getting into this industry or being an artist, having it be your first hand at um, monetizing that in the cannabis industry, there had to have been some type of, you know, other struggle, other struggle outside of just getting paid. Right. So tell us more about your company why it was created and where you are today. Gotcha. So let me see if I can keep track of ever, all the points that you made, <laughs> all the questions. You so to start, um, so I recently pivoted into doing, into being an illustration studio. I've gone through a whole world of changes over the past three years because I mean, life is an experience, an experiment. I, my background, my degree is in Japanese. I don't have a background in marketing other than what I've learned working in the industry on my own. So ultimately, when I first started the company, like I said, it was to do freelance writing. So it was to do blog writing. And that was I went under what? Of course, I was Elena Dorsey. Then I went under 
something with Bud nodding. I got up to Bud Biz. I was can I was Elena Dorsey, Can Elena, Bud Biz Llama, Bud Biz Lady, Bud Biz Creative. And then I'm kind of a basic person. If I don't like how I pronounce something or how something feels in my mouth, I don't want to keep <laughs> using it. So last year I decided to rebrand completely as faded. And like I had said, because of clearly that's a, it's not an easy name to just get faded. I had to add something else to it. And I didn't really know to add studio or strategy at the time. So I was just like, all right, just throw my, throw part of my name in there. So it's faded lane, but I just call it faded. But mm -hmm. ultimately as an illustration studio, kind of backed by there's an entrepreneur rising, maybe already well-known design entrepreneur named Chris Doe. He has the future and the future is all about teaching creatives how to make money and how to get paid well. So getting into illustration was, I guess, also again, a personal renaissance of accepting that I'm an artist because it's kind of been a rejection because I feel that society rejects art Society likes consuming art, but it doesn't really respect artists. And especially from a business standpoint, it's getting involved with the future, exploring, being in marketing, and just developing as a creative. It's what kind of business problems can I solve with art? And to me, that was also a matter of if I'm going to put my art out there, I want people to know I did it. If I'm doing work for people, I want it to make an impact and I want to cause or make, yeah, I want to make a cultural impact. So to me, the answer was product, product illustration. So doing package illustration, doing merchandise, especially for cannabis brands that think slapping your logo onto a t-shirt makes people want to buy it. So it's also been like filling in that gap of kind of helping companies develop non-plant touching income streams and art is a method to do that but for the physical spaces as well um, I want to paint murals because as COVID eventually dies off people are going or people are already in physical spaces and yeah. at least in my experience people are kind of demoralized so I think art helps lift the spirit absolutely you know what I can agree with that and as an entrepreneur you hit on some really important points and I don't know if you realize this, but, you know, you had to pivot several times in the past three years. The thing is, is that you didn't quit. You didn't give up. You pivoted. And as an entrepreneur, being able to pivot when you don't feel like you're going in the right direction or it, like you said, if you didn't like the way the words sounded in your mouth or coming out of your mouth, you know, you, you wanted to change that, but you pivoted. And, and now you found your brand, you found your name, you know, and I really like that. I love the originality and the authenticity behind it. And so my next question is, what type of companies or who can actually benefit from the products and services that you offer? I think any brand other than having, you know, a workable budget, <laughs> I think any brand that really values the human spirit and making a cultural impact based on that. I believe that cannabis, cannabis in itself already has a culture and a community. And again, that's part of what helped me decide to use art in this space is because art is a, is cultural. It shapes humans. So it's, I want to work with companies that essentially want to invest in the longevity of their brand from a, I mean, at the end of the day, branding is connected with community, but to who actually wanna make a difference as far as building those connections, helping people to feel excited about life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like part of, like in my bio, part of like my mission that I suddenly got inspired is like, is literally to shut adults up because I'm 32, I feel like I'm a fresh 3.0 adult or I'm just in level, I'm a level two adult and I'm entering the second decade of being one. And it's like, it seems like every year the complaints I hear just increase. And 
Of course, we're living in Rona land, so there's even more reason for discontent, but it's ultimately, you know, when you talk about those big cultural or emotional, spiritual shifts for people, I want to be a part of that, and I want to be with companies that see the value in that. I love the way you put that. Um, you so eloquently put that, and it totally makes sense. I love the fact that you want to work with brands that um, respect their brand and they're looking for brand longevity. Um, I think that's key because a lot of people believe that a brand is just a logo, right? And that's a mistake that many entrepreneurs, you know, make literally out the door. Um, and so it sounds like you help them fill the gap of really, you know, being able to illustrate what their brand means and what it represents and bringing in community um, as a whole, you know, and, and having it come out throughout the illustrations that you actually, um, you know, produce and provide for your customers. Is, am I right about any yeah. of that? Very much correct. Awesome. So as an African-American woman, right, in business for yourself and taking that leap as an entrepreneur, you know, you mentioned a few of the obstacles that you have faced and overcome. Are there any other obstacles that you faced and overcome? And what would you tell other women seeking to enter this industry? Um, so... As far as being a Black woman in the industry, I don't feel like I've encountered anything. I mean, I could have encountered bullshit because of my identity, <laughs> but as far as I know, I've only encountered typical business issues um, as far as communication, but I feel like it's weird to say, it's not really weird to say it, I've grown up in white environments, so I feel that I give off energy that white people feel safe with, that I make, that they think that we're friends and, you know, I don't run into any issues, as far as I know. Um, my thing to any, especially Black woman entering the industry or working in the industry, is my philosophy is that the systems that be that get in our way and make us or try to influence us to think less of ourselves or to deal with things that other races and other identities don't have to deal with. Um, it can sound naive and too simplistic, but it's kind of like, you gotta tune that shit out <laughs> um, as far as, I've been working on having an anchor of who I am, and that is my self-protection. When you hear a lot of people talk about being protective energy and this and that, it's if you're grounded and if you know who you are and you're grounded in yourself and what you want to do, you ain't got to do all that other stuff. And you don't really have to pay attention to what other people are saying or doing. It's, yeah, feel upset in the moment if someone insults you or tries to get over on you. But at the end of the day, it's, as I've learned, hanging on to anything outside of you is draining you from what we're supposed to do. And we're all going to die. We all have but so much energy in the day. So may as well put it in what you care about, because I'm personally tired of other people and things trying to get me to care about shit I don't care about when I have things that I want to do that I would rather have my focus and energy in. Man, not that's easy. a mouthful. <laughs> That's a mouthful, but you hit the nail on the head and you're so right. Because as women, sometimes we can get drawn into gossip. We can get drawn into, you know, we can lose focus, like lose our direction, especially if we're associating with the wrong crowd, if you will. And so I think you hit the nail on the, on the head, you know, by saying stay focused, you know, and bring in the energy and do the things that you want to do as a woman and don't allow anyone else to define you or, um, you know, make you feel less than. So that is absolutely um, some very good advice. So women out there, let me tell you, I hope you're listening because that is really, really important. It is hard to do. It's very hard, I would think, to, um, you know, not listen to that stuff. But like Elena says, you have to block it out and stay focused on your focus. 
So Elena, what is important um, or the most important need that you have right now? What are you looking for? And what do you need in your company right now? Um, right now, I just need brands that are ready to invest in their longevity. That's wow. Good. Yeah, that's just about where I'm at. Everything else I need, I got to do myself. Okay. Is this big companies, small companies, mid-sized companies? What kind of companies do you work with? Do you work with startups? Um, honestly, at this point in the game, I work with more established companies. Okay. <laughs> startups, y'all cool, but y'all need a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't have all the resources for startups so more established companies um especially brick and mortar that's what I'm especially with the murals that's what I'm looking to break into and I'm still trying to figure out originally my quota was doing like one mural a quarter but I may want to do more than that but yeah established companies brick and mortar I'm in Maryland, but it kind of doesn't matter where you are because I've worked with companies all over the continent. So, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So bottom line is that you work with companies that have a budget to invest in themselves. And now what if it's a startup that actually has a budget and says, hey, yeah, look, this is I'm just getting started, but I do have a budget and I want to work with you. Will you work with them or do they still need too much um oh I guess my the good and bad thing about me is I'm willing to give everybody a chance <laughs> so it really just depends on like we can talk and see if it works out mm -hmm. I mean everybody, I feel like most people get at least a 20 minute consultation to get to know that because you got to know if you work together before you can actually work so mm -hmm. that's just my standpoint absolutely well Thank you so much for being with us. How can our audience reach out to you? How can companies find you so that they can have that conversation and see if there's a fit um, of, for doing business together? Yeah, so right now I'm updating, cleaning up my website, but my website is Faded Lane. So it's Faded, L-A-I-N dot com. Um, otherwise on the socials, I'm active on LinkedIn. So I'm under my government name, Elena M. Dorsey. And other than that, yeah, I'm on Clubhouse as Elena the Muse and Twitter as Elena the Muse, trying to keep that consistency. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank you so much for um, being a guest with us here on the Cannabis Minority Report podcast. We'd love to have you back on the show in the future. Check on your progress, see where you are, see if you've gotten a lot of clients that you're looking for who are ready to invest in their longevity. We wish you so much success, Elena, um, with your business, and uh, we look forward to speaking with you again. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for the time. You're welcome. All right, ladies and gentlemen, be sure to subscribe to the Cannabis Minority Report on Spotify, on Stitcher, on Apple Podcasts, or on your favorite platforms to make sure that you don't miss it. Now, instead of us going to a final commercial this week, we were live in Detroit um, in September interviewing Christine De La Rosa. And so we're going to run that table. Well, hello, Christine Dalarosa. I love you. Just let me say that oh, first thank you off. So much. <laughs> yes. So I have admired you from afar for such a long time and had the pleasure and still have the pleasure of working with you in the at the DEIC of the NCIA. Tell our audience a little bit about you, why you came into the industry and what you're doing in the industry. Sure. Um, well, I came into the industry because I have lupus. And prior to um, being part of the cannabis industry, um, I was like, diagnosed when I almost died in 2010. I had pulmonary mm. embolism while driving. And um, I spent five years really sick. Uh, I ended up having to stop work. I was taking 11 pills a day. Of those, five of those were opioids for pain. I was doing a monthly treatment uh, at the hospital every month just so I could walk with a cane. Um, and pretty much I did not work at all for five years and I was bedridden. Wow. Ran through my, five, my 401k, ran through my savings. And then one day I woke up 
And I was like, huh, what happens if I get to be 60 and I'm taking all of these pills and all of these opioids and all of these steroids and I don't feel better? Mm. So I started to look for alternatives and that's how I got to cannabis. And the reason I got to cannabis is because I was desperate. And, mm. and I kept seeing that there was stuff there that I could use. So it took me about nine months and I found a regimen that worked for me. Okay. And I got off all of my medication. I've been in remission since 2015. Why? I don't take Congratulations. any. Congratulations. Thank you. I don't take any um, of the monthly, I don't go to the hospital once a month. And so at that point I could have gone back to my previous life, which was as a technology person. I was mm -hmm. a database architect for the large um, telecoms. Okay. But I was pissed. I was like five years, five years I could have been using cannabis and I lived in California, had very much access to it, mm -hmm. but why didn't I do it? Yeah. Because as a Mexican person, we were trained by our parents who didn't know any better. I remember my mother told me when I went to college, don't smoke marijuana. They're gonna think you're a lazy Mexican. Mm. So that kind of propaganda and stigma stopped me from finding out five years earlier during my highest earning years yeah. that I could use cannabis instead of tramadol instead of hydromorphine, hydrocortone, fentanyl patches, oxycontin. I could have used that instead. Wow. So I couldn't go back to my previous life because I was like, there's a lot of people of color out here living with that stigma. That's right. Who, are, who don't have health care that might be buying stuff that's not good for them because they don't want to use the thing that is good for them because yeah. we've been trained that that's, an asha that's a shameful thing. Yeah. And that, that was that reef of madness era, yes. man. So yes. how do you get past that? And what are you doing, um, you know, your contribution to the industry to kind of combat that shit? Can I say that shit? Yeah. Oh, yes, okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> Well, I think that it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Like, when I came home in 2015 to tell my mother I was going to start a cannabis business, mm -hmm. the very first thing out of her mouth was, why are you always shaming the family? Oh. And that was hard, right? The, you know, now they help me. They're so proud of me. But oh, it was a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. Mm -hmm. Over time, they had to learn it. And I find, and I know you know this, Khadija, in communities of color, mm -hmm. we talk to each other. Yeah. It's a hand-to-hand, -hand, just like you know, uh, Ruben was saying yesterday, I was thinking that's very true. It's a hand-to-hand -hand conversation. Yeah. Like, why do you think weed is bad? Mm -hmm. what, what, is your, what is your basis of analysis? Yeah. And they'll say, they won't be able to identify it, except that there was propaganda that was out there for us to see. This is your brain on drugs. This is a war on drugs. This is a, you know, it's not any of those. It was a war yeah. on us. Yeah, it absolutely was yeah. a war on us. Yeah. And, you know, so I hear that you're speaking about social equity. Yeah. You're also speaking about the BIPOC community. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So what I did was is I ended up creating an underground dispensary in Oakland. Um, so I come from the legacy market. I used okay. to be one of those people driving up and down the five, you know, the 580 with pounds in my trunk. Um, and all of this was for medical use. We had about 4,500 patients mm. in the underground market that we serviced every month. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I noticed, like there was eight legal dispensaries that sat around us. I was in downtown Oakland. I'm like, why do I have 4,500 people coming to my dispensary? Because we look like them. Mm. Because we were black, we were brown, we were queer, we were older, we were disabled. So they felt comfortable as opposed to coming yeah. into many of those dispensaries, which were mostly white run. Yeah. And not, like no offense to that, but I want to go to places where I feel like you understand my problem. That's right. Right. And so that was when I realized that we had to have representation. Otherwise, we would continue to buy from the underground market and no shade to the underground market. They do a great job of marketing. Yeah. Right. They, have, they do a great job. And I have no hate for that at all. Mm -hmm. But also, I want people to be able to buy from the legal industry to know what's in their weed, to know what their certificate of analysis are, to have a standard higher than their guy on the yeah. corner. And that's, not, that's also a true statement. Yeah. So I've realized we had to have our people representing, our people had to be in ownership positions, not just in worker positions. That's right. They had to be in investment positions that's and they right. had to understand that. You know, a lot of times we are, we are slow to enter a market mm -hmm because we don't understand the market. That's but right. this market we built. That's right. We built this market. We understand this market and we understand how to market. Absolutely. Right? And we literally, well, not my culture, but definitely your culture is the culture yeah. that everybody follows around the world. That is so true. So there cannot in any possible way be no representation of us, which is why I created the people's ecosystem. 
Man, I love that. Mm -hmm. And I love you because you're, first of all, you're just a bucket of knowledge. That's number one. <laughs> and you're not afraid to share that knowledge. You're not afraid to uplift other women and other people yes. of color. And I love that about you. Thank you. So tell us about the People's Ecosystem. So the People's Ecosystem started out as the People's Dispensary. Mm -hmm. And we had about eight different companies throughout California and Oregon. Mm -hmm. What we did last year during the pandemic, we had to rethink what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And we did a huge pivot where we moved everybody into a holdings company. So now all of the separate entities are one entity. Oh, nice. And so now everything's the people's. We have the people's cannabis. We just, our new product line is coming out. I just got the first video. Ah. Um, and it's a full line of products for California and it's okay. called Smoke This. Okay. So, so we're just going to tell you how it's going to be. Uh, and then <laughs> that's we have, right. So that's the People's Cannabis. We have the People's Wellness, which is all the CBD branded products that we're doing. We have the People's Farm. We just acquired a 45-acre farm in New Mexico. Nice. Um, that we're cutting up into five-acre lots for micro businesses to be okay. able to utilize the land because we have an aquifer oh, underneath us. I love that. Right. Yes. And then we also have the People's... Um, delivery so everything that we have is branded the people's and so yeah. we have all of the vertical so we have the whole vertical from cultivation to seed to sale okay um all under the people's brand wow mm -hmm. it has been a pleasure interviewing you how can people reach out to you sure i am christine Rosa at the people's ecosystem .com. oh my god i love you so much thank you so much for interviewing May me Khadija. You? of course oh, thank you oh. all right you guys we are back and the industry insights that includes our NCIA member spotlight series. You know, here's the thing. We highlight some of the new, some of our new members who have joined us through the Social Equity Scholarship Program. Don't forget to download the NCIA's mobile app. You guys, we have our own mobile app. Check us out. Don't forget. And then join us at this year's NCIA's Cannabis Business Summit that takes place in San Francisco, California, December 15th through the 17th. And yes, your girl will be there. Go to CannabisBusinessSummit.com. That's CannabisBusinessSummit.com. Just as it sounds, it is spelled the same way. We look forward to seeing you there. And hey, a special shout out to our DEI program sponsors, Tahoe Wellness Center. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. The law offices of Omar Figueroa. I love your high energy. Love the fact that you support us so much. Mwah, mwah, mwah. And then Copper State Farms. Hey, thumbs up. Thank you again. We appreciate you. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, the mission of the DEIC committee is to educate, to advocate, to engage and empower the community of cannabis and its members by cultivating partnerships with other nonprofit organizations with similar goals, providing resources that create and sustain an environment that is inclusive, that is equitable, and that is also diverse. We are committed to building a culture that respects our members and celebrates their contributions as we work together to strengthen all communities in cannabis. Do you know someone that you think should be interviewed on the Cannabis Minority Report podcast? Drop your girl a line at info at KhadijaAdams.com. Until next Monday, peace, love, and hippie stuff. NCIA's Cannabis Minority Report is a product of the National Cannabis Industry Association and NCIA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. We are hosted every week by Khadijah Adams. Our executive producers are Aaron Smith and Vince Chandler. We are directed by Vince Chandler and produced by Bethany Moore. Please, please, please find out everything you can about the growing and equitable cannabis industry at thecannabisindustry.org.